What's up, friends? Jacob Stiefel here. Welcome to the Don't Stifle Me podcast. Now, I know I say this a lot, but today's episode, is I promise, is one of my absolute favorites that I've done so far. Maybe my favorite. I don't know. It's kind of hard to pick at this point. But before we get to it, I want to remind you, this podcast for now is brought to you by Jacob Stiefel. That's right, me. I am a singer-songwriter with music, merchandise, tour dates, all available at jacobstiefel.com or on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you go for your musical fix. Uh, I'll be there waiting on you. Anyway, so I'm still in Texas. I'll be hanging out uh, around Austin, Texas this week and weekend. I'll be in Huffman over close to Houston, Texas, July 18th at Lobello's Pub, Port Neches over close to Beaumont, Texas on July 19th at the Neches Brewing Company, and then all the way back over to Muscle Shoals, Alabama, Friday, July the 21st for a lunchtime Radio Kicks 96 show at Champy's Chicken. So if you're around any of those places, come hang out, have a drink or some fried chicken or whatever. Okay, well, I'm glad you're here. I'm here. We're all here together. So let's get to it. Here is episode 19. Pick it up the <laughs> Today's guest is Eric Breisch. He one of the coolest, most genuine, and overwhelmingly talented people that I've met in a long time. I don't even remember when. Uh, but talented in a different way than the guests I usually have here on the podcast. Eric is a visual artist, working mainly with metal in a style that it's kind of hard to explain. Only he and his mentor know how to do it, and it involves engrave or grinding down pieces of aluminum and paint and awesome things that you should check out and look at. Uh, we talk more about it in the episode, but you should go look at some pictures. He's got an Instagram, Eric Bryce art. Um, he's got a website and I'll also have pictures and links up on the show notes page at don't stifle me dot com slash zero one nine. But anyway, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this conversation, so I'll just let you hear it for yourself. Hopefully you will agree. Here is my talk with Eric Bryce. Eric Bryce on the Don't Stifle Me podcast with Jacob Stiefel is a lot of vowel work. That's right. <laughs> Two Germans. I was thinking about that earlier today. I was like, it's a lot of, uh, yeah, it's a lot of having to think about E's and I's and stuff. I'm sure we've both grown up with the same uh, butchering of the last name, right? Yes. Yeah, probably yeah. so. E and I and... Yeah, forget all that. Yeah, when I met you, I was like, spell, is it B-R-E-I? And you were like, yes, actually it is. It is. I That's knew it. it. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> how's it going, man? Um, how's, how is everything? How's that beer? It's good. It's cold. You know, Eric it's only, was, what, 102 degrees outside, so... Is that what it was? Oh, yeah. I think it was like... Yeah, it was in the upper 90s when I was on my way down here this yeah. morning, so... Yeah, no, this is like the... This is the long stretch right now. June through about... Sometimes middle September is when, you know, you're going to suffer here in South Texas. So right. you just got to... You know, those of us that grew up here, um, we're kind of used to it, and we've we've learned to kind of adapt, but uh, the people that come down to visit just absolutely can't stand it, so yeah. I can't blame them. <laughs> So, okay. First off, I want to ask, because I've, when I've told people that I'm excited about this, having you on here, yeah, I try to tell them what you do. And like in the music world, there's, everybody says they're an artist. But when I tell people you're an artist, I'm like, no, he's like a, like a real artist. <laughs> like a, <laughs> well, musicians are real artists. I mean, and, and yeah, it all, it all is for sure. Yeah, I, I always have to preface it with uh, with visual artist. Is that the best way to say it? Because that's, that's what I was trying to think of. That's what people then start to, to to put together. Okay, so you're some type of like a painter, or you're like a, you know, you. I guess that you could even go into performance art, and there's all these different types of arts in the visual side now. Yeah. Um, you know, traditionally it used to just be you know you had oil painters or something like that. Um, but now, I mean, you've just got everybody's using every kind of medium to, to, 
you know, be a visual artist now. So I usually have to preface it with that and then I'll lead into it with, yeah, I'm, I'm a painter. And when I say that, they, they're like, okay, like I, I get what you're, what you're, you know, trying to get to. Yeah. You can't um, come out and say painter first. Cause they'll be like, Oh, so you paint like barns and yeah, stuff. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, yeah, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta paint this room, man. Could you come over and like, yeah, you know, so I, I do. And, and, um, and people and still like, they don't have an idea. They think I'm out there painting maybe landscapes or something like that. And Bob Ross in it, Bob Ross in it. Yeah, man. Yeah. And, uh, and that's not the case. You know, it's, I'm, I'm a contemporary artist, abstract artist. And those that people that aren't familiar with that kind of like lineage of how abstract art came in and, and what it's led up to now, uh, usually I have to break out the phone and show photos so they, they understand kind of like what it is. And even then it's right. difficult because you've seen the work in person. Yeah. And the, the photos just can't capture it. You really have to stand in front of the work. Yeah, I've right? done the same thing. Exactly. I was just showing somebody yesterday. I was like, look at this. And, and they, they looked at it. But I was like, no, you just, you it's just not don't the same. Yeah. 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 And that's been the biggest struggle, I think. Um, you know, having shows in San Antonio and living here, it's a little bit easier because I can put on shows. People show up, they see it in person. Um, it's a little bit harder when I when I start to expand in other cities like Santa Fe or Hawaii, and and I try to tell them like what's going on, and I try to direct them to the galleries that I'm represented by so they can go into there and, and actually see it in person and get an idea of like what's going on. Because otherwise, I've struggled with uh, like online marketing and yeah. and you know even submitting to galleries for shows and all of that. They get it and they're like, oh, it looks cool. Um, don't know really what I'm looking at, uh, and, and, and that's right. you know sometimes you show them a video, but but because we have two eyes, that's why we get the dimension as you move around the work. And even with a video, a camera still only has one eye, and you still don't get the true dimension of like of what it feels like okay. when you stand yeah. in front of it. Well, yeah, yeah. I would have thought about that. Um, yeah, I was wondering. I, I was really one of the reasons I'm really looking forward to talking with you on here is that I get a chance to be even more ignorant than usual <laughs> uh, because there's so much about like it's cause there's one of my favorite things about these conversations is that we can all see differences in things. We can easily point out the differences between what you do and what I do and this and that. But the most interesting part to me is the similarities. So yeah. getting to talk about like how you start out and in my mind, I'm thinking like that versus, you know, my experience with starting out in music and, and yeah. what I, the stories I've heard from all different people. So, um, so we'll, you know, we hopefully we'll touch on a lot of stuff, but like when, so when you're talking about doing the exhibits and, and shows, do you have like an agent or somebody that reaches out to these places that has the relationships or do you just have to contact and say, Hey, I've got some cool shit. Well, <laughs> and, and this is really a great question because so many people don't understand uh, what it really takes. And even as as emerging artists, artists don't even understand like what it takes to get out there and, and do what you want to do. Now, you know, if you go to school and you get a degree like a like a bachelor of fine arts and you go on to a master of fine arts and all that sometimes you get out of school and you still don't know how to approach a gallery and you still don't know how to get your work shown. You just have a degree yeah. and you know how to potentially make art, right? Doesn't uh -huh. mean just cause you have a degree doesn't even mean it's going to be good. Right. Um, and, and I'm still a firm believer of it's just in you. It's kind of like being a musician, you know, you know, if, if songwriting is in you and you know, if you pick up an instrument and you can play it and you can, uh, just because you learn the open chords doesn't mean you're going to put together a hit song, right? Yeah. So the same kind of thing happens there. I don't have a formal art degree, and I'll get into kind of some of that a little bit later. But, you know, to answer your question, um, I started off basically on my own, and then I, I started in the city that I lived in, uh, which at the time was was Houston, and uh, and I started – you know, networking. And that's probably the most important thing that there is. You, you've got to get out there. You've got to go to all the shows. You got to shake all the hands. You got to meet the who's who in the, in the sounds, art world. Sounds very familiar. Yeah. Right. Like you got to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's a lot of that. And I would say probably, I don't know, 40 to 50% of my time is, is spent doing that and, yeah. and just staying relevant hmm. in people's eyes and in minds and, and just getting out there and supporting other artists too. Like you got to go to their shows because they're going to come to your shows. And it's yeah. just a, you know, it's, it's a good community like that. But, um, the first time I, I, I got a gallery, had a show, it was, it was successful. Um, and so I got representation through that gallery. And then from there, um, the, the artists that I had met through that gallery or other collectors, they, they were the ones that introduced me to other galleries outside of, um, San Antonio, like okay. Santa Fe 
in New Mexico, uh, a couple different galleries in Hawaii, uh, Houston. And so it, it all is about who you know. And if you're just sitting there cold calling or emailing every single day to the galleries, like forget about it because they get a stack of, you know, a thousand different oh, portfolios yeah. or resumes every single day. Like, hey, will you show my work or whatever? That just goes in the trash. Um, and and it's probably the same thing on music. You send CDs in and a hundred percent, a hundred percent, right? hundred percent the same. It's, so, you might as well be sitting here and yeah. explaining what I do. <laughs> it's like, it's two parallel things. And that's why I've always, and, and just to digress a little bit, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I have a, a degree in music, um, from full sale. And hmm. so from the recording, remember it, if we talked about that before, maybe not, so, yeah. maybe I mentioned that to you, but, um, but I got a degree in recording arts and, okay. and from full sale and also a business degree in entertainment arts. And, um, and so I really wanted to be a musician since I was like in fourth grade. I remember, uh, Guns N' Roses coming on huh. and Appetite for Destruction was like, that was it for me. I, I said, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to be a rock and roller. Huh. And, uh, and my mom w- <laughs> still is Christian to this day. And, uh, and she heard that record and was like, no way you're never going to be a, you know, a rock and roll star and all that. And, and I asked her for all my friends were getting in bands and it's all the that. Devil. It's the devil. the devil. Yeah, exactly. In Dallas, Texas, yeah. you know, uh, back in the eighties. And so I, is I that com- where you we can go back. What, was that where you were born? Or um, were you born? I was born in Houston. I was kind of an oil and gas like brat. Um, okay. meaning I moved all over Texas and Oklahoma growing up. And, uh, and so I was born in Houston and then moved, I think over to Tyler. And then I ended up being in Dallas from, I don't know, I don't know what grades that was, maybe kindergarten to fourth grade. And I guess it was third or fourth grade when that album came out and I had an older brother and, and, uh, he taught me all about, you know, music and, and I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And I asked my mom, Hey, you know, I really want electric guitar. Cause all my friends are like starting a band and, and, uh, and one day I come home and there's a banjo sitting on the bed and, <laughs> you know, as a kid in fourth grade, yeah. you're like, what the hell is, what that? is that? You know, it's not a, you know, it's not something you pick it up and it's got four strings. It doesn't sound like an electric yeah. guitar. How am I going to play sweet child of mine? Exactly. On the banjo. The banjo mom. Yeah. <laughs> and she just didn't quite like, you know, couldn't put those two things together. And I broke a couple strings. That thing disappeared. I never saw it again. I never asked for another guitar until, uh, you know, I got out and, uh, 18 years old, went into the military and got my first guitar in huh. San Diego, California. What, what branch were you in? I was in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Nice. Four, <clears throat> four years active duty. And, uh, and so that's when I first got my guitar and that's what, what years were that was 1997. Okay. And I got out in August of 2001. Wow. My first day on the job in like the civilian world yeah. was September the 11th. Oh man! And I walked into uh, yikes! I walked into work that day. We had these big, big screens on the TV. Where were you? Where was that? I was in job? San Diego, and um, in right down, you know, from the base that I had gotten out of, you know. Yeah. So it was only a twenty minute drive up, and uh, and I walk in, I see all the planes, you know, hitting the buildings, and yeah. all that stuff was going on. I went in and called my captain, uh, my old captain, because in the military you have to sign uh, a eight year contract, four years of active duty, four years of inactive. Uh, oh, reserve, okay. meaning that those four years after you get out, they can call you back at any time. Huh. So uh, here I am thinking it's just a matter of time. Like I'm going to get called back right. and we're going to war, you know, sure. and uh, and my captain said, stay by the phone. You know, if you get called, like, you know what you got to do and come back. And I was a sergeant at the time. And uh, and a lot of my Marines that I was working with at the time ended up going over there and experiencing that whole thing. And I never got called back. Wow. So, yeah, what a what a strange window to be huh. in and then see all of those people go through it, yeah. how they get changed coming back. Some people didn't come back, you know, and it yeah, was a, sure. a really heavy, uh, a heavy war and it's been a heavy war for yeah, what? still, yeah. yeah for 17 16, years. Almost. Yeah, whatever, yeah. So yeah, man. Um, but, but you know, that was, that was really off, off track, but th- you know, I have a, I have a huge understanding of what musicians go through and I, and I really, wanted to do that with my life. And then from the recording side, everything went to kind of went to shit when Apple, like the iTunes thing came out and then mm-hmm. everybody started for recording sure. at home. And yeah. now the big like studios are being reserved for these, the head engineers, these pirates with the their laptops and their exactly. garage band, you know, like we're sitting here doing. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, that, that really kind of changed the direction of my path and, mm-hmm. and, uh, 
what ultimately kind of like steered me into what I'm doing now. And it's still the foundation of what I do. Meaning, did you have like when you were younger, growing up through school, did you do visual arts at all then? Or was it, you know, just whatever? I took a couple, I I remember drawing when I was young and doing some figurative stuff. I never really took it seriously because, you know, in my family, the arts weren't really that encouraged Mm -hmm. and like music and art and all that. It just was something that you just played around with or did. And, um, and so I did a little of it. I took a, I think an art class in high school and, uh, and I was typical Texas, you know, we played all the sports, we did all those types of things and, yeah. and, you know, you partied you and play football? You played football, what played basketball. Play I was a wide receiver for, okay. for a year because I played other, my other years I played basketball and ran track and, mm. you know, did that whole thing. And, uh, and so, you know, most of my time was taken up with that and you're partying and you got girlfriends and, and all that stuff. And then 18, you go into the military and that's certainly not encouraged. Right. So, yeah. you know, you go through Stand all of in that. Line, do as you're told. Oh you're yeah, like absolutely. Yeah. And, and I was, I always had a little bit of that rebellious side in me where <clears throat> I knew that it wasn't going to be a lifelong thing for me being the military. I yeah. was using it as a stepping stone because I wasn't a great student in high school and I knew that college wasn't going to be something that I was going to jump right into and be successful at. Yeah. So um, I took that opportunity and admiral thing. Yeah. Know, and, and to serve your country. Right. Like, I mean, it's all, it's all good things. And it certainly taught me to be a man and, and be responsible. And I think it gave me a great foundation on, uh, you know, what I needed to do. And so, um, you know, not, all, when I got out of the military and I was working for an IT company, I decided to go back to school. And that's when I went to full sail from about 2002 to 2005. And, um, and that really opened me up to a lot of visual, artistic things. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there was music going on all the time. There was all these other friends that I had that were in film and were in animation and were doing all th- these different types of projects that we yeah. would all work like together on because they needed music or we needed like a, a commercial Album shot or something, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, we did uh, we did a lot of cross collaboration, and that really kind of sparked that that idea in me that I wanted to do something. Um, artistic. And then when I got out of school in 2005, I moved back to California. And that's where I started working for a company that um, made clothes for like Billabong and Volcom and Quicksilver and all these surf and skate brands, right? Okay. So we're this little three or four man shop over in Oceanside, California. And we're in this like warehouse. So what area of California is that? Oceanside is uh, right about 30 minutes north of San Diego. Okay. Yeah, so right, um, you know, hour and a half south of L.A., you know. Between there, yeah. Yeah, between right. there. And um, and so I was working with these guys, and, I mean, one of the coolest jobs ever. Like, we would go surfing in the middle of the day and, and you know, could do basically whatever we wanted to do. But we get to work with these really great, cool companies, uh, creating all different types of clothing design. And we would work with China to get all that stuff made and then do all the logistics from getting it to China to, like, pack sun stores and all of that. Yeah. So you know, visually that, that got me really thinking about like t-shirt design and all this different types of stuff and colors and how that all gets put together. And, um, and so I left California cause it was just getting, it was just getting ridiculous out there expense wise. And, and I came, a friend of mine was living here in San Antonio and he said, Hey, come back here. We'll get a place together and we'll, you know, start doing stuff. He said, I know a lot of people here in town. Well, I came back and I ended up going to work for a bank. And so, you know, into this corporate world, I kind of like got into in yeah. 2006. And, um, and it was that start where I, where I had a dream one night. Um, it, and I, I was painting a painting and I woke up the next day and my girlfriend at the time, uh, I, I told her, uh, you know, I had this weird dream about, about painting a painting. And I think I'm, I'm going to go to like Hobby Lobby or something. I'm going to get a canvas and just wow. see what happens. So you weren't doing any of that. I wasn't I doing mean, anything, like nothing. Hmm. And my roommate at the time said, Hey, I took an art class. I still have a toolbox over there and it's got a bunch of brushes and paints in it. I knew nothing about oil paint. How old were you at that point? I was, uh, so 2006, I must've been, it's 10, 20, like 26, 27. Yeah. Wow. So 26, 27 so, yeah. years old, you know, in this like corporate world now. And remember, I, you know, I'm, I'm tattooed up and I have long hair and all that. And I was still kind of that way in the corporate world. So yeah. everybody kind of knew that I came from this, this background that, yeah. yeah, it wasn't really like a little different, it, different. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but y- you know, so I, I didn't have any of this kind of experience and, 
in oils or acrylics or any of that kind of knowledge. And I remember buying a, a, a canvas and I came home and I painted this painting and I think it was like this giant flower or something like that, which is really funny. Um, but I painted this painting and I painted a couple more little things and people started to look at it and they said, Oh man, that's pretty cool. Like, you know, I started getting some positive feedback and reinforcement and, uh, and that's really where the light clicked on for me. Like, Hey, I want to try to see what I can do with this and pursue it. And I started really like looking at art and thinking about what I had seen growing up and, you know, what really interested me. And, and, um, so I think it was a good thing that I didn't have any idea what it meant to be an artist and what kind of road I was going to go down because, I think if you're, yeah, music, I was wondering if you grew up with like influences, like I really like this artist or I really like this artist, but if, it, I mean, I was exposed to all the abstract expressionists out of the fifties and sixties, like, you know, Jackson Pollock and, and, yeah. um, de Kooning and Rothko and all these people that were like, you know, if you go into MoMA in New York city in the, in the museum up there, like that's what you're seeing. What you see, and and okay. so, you know, I was drawn to that at an early age and I liked that type of work and I still do to this very day. Uh, and I think that was a lot of, uh, of influence, even subconsciously uh, yeah. back then. And um, and so not knowing any of that, I started because I was in San Antonio at the time. I started talking to a couple of different people and and started going to a couple of different shows and like seeing what the whole art scene was about. And then I got this opportunity to move to Houston. And so I did that in 2000 and I guess that was 2000 and six or seven. So I, I go over there, and Houston's a big city, obviously. So when you say going to the shows, is that just like different exhibits that different yeah. people have? Yeah, people put on shows. And yeah. like in, in San Antonio, there's a place called Blue Star Art Complex. Uh -huh. And it's basically like where all the shows were happening at that time. So you just show up there, and like everybody's drinking beer and you oh, know having a good time. Piece, you yeah. know, like, and again, like being a newbie, I had no idea like how this whole thing even happened or, you know, yeah. w you know, what people were working with medium wise and all of that. So I had a really huge learning curve to kind of get over. And, uh, and that's right when I started to, you know, got this offer to go to Houston. So I went there cause I, at that time I had switched from a bank to a oil and gas company. Okay. Okay. And so, um, uh, went, went to work there and Houston was, a, is, a, is still a major, major art scene in the U S. Hmm. So I go there and then I get exposed to the real like galleries and the real big, like the big dogs out there. Yeah. And I started going to these openings where these, like these artists were selling out their shows and these paintings were like sometimes up to 75 thousand a hundred thousand dollars right so selling out does that mean like people buy tickets to be able just to go in no 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 like it's always free but selling the artwork oh, selling, off the wall basically oh, like selling all like of the selling pieces? all the pieces wow. during a show and like yeah, you know okay. in, the, in the gallery making like you know eight hundred thousand dollars or something <laughs> like that you know yeah. so i saw i saw that and i said wow well you know obviously it's lucrative again naive to the fact that it takes a long time to get to that point, yeah, right? right? To get yeah. that representation. Be like going to see Garth Brooks or something and be like, oh, it's lucrative to play music. You <laughs> yeah. Know? yeah. It's like, like, man, he sells out uh, Central Park. Like, yeah. man, it must be pretty easy to do. Let's just go ahead and do that. Um, but it was a lot harder than I thought. However, I've always been really good at getting into that scene and networking and making friends and doing that. So I started, I started hanging out in those, at those shows and getting to know the gallery owners and I got to know this one really well. And, uh, and that's really where my, not only education began, but it's also where I found my mentor. Um, his name is Andreas Notabom from Germany. Really interesting story. Uh, but basically saw his work in there for the first time. And I was already kind of working with some metal to some degree, but when I saw Andreas's work, I was like, that's it. That's exactly what so I want to do. So you saw his at a show. Yes. There. Never had seen anything like it and never yeah. seen anything like it since. Cause he was the one that created this media. Tell, explain kind of, I know it's hard to explain, especially over just audio, but like right. kind of explain what it is. Cause I tell people it's like, well, it's in metal and he carves shit and there's color and yeah. there's light and there's yeah. <laughs> well, that, and that's the thing is everybody, even when they see it in person, they're always like looking behind the, the, the metal plates and all this, like, where is it being lit from and how does it work? And because basically we start with this, uh, aluminum is what we use the majority of the time. So we start with this sheet of aluminum and we fabricate it to where it's like a canvas where it hangs on our wall and, and we can actually manipulate it. So we start with this raw piece of aluminum and we have some techniques to like get that piece prepped and then we'll use a variety of different tools to go in there and essentially scratch the surface of this metal. And by scratching the surface of the metal, 
um, we had these, this like strip of overhead lights that shine down onto the, onto the painting. And so every time I scratch that surface with one of these tools, if I do it in such a way, because it all has to do with like geometry and physics and kind of like how light comes in is the same way it goes out. Yeah. Um, and Reflections so often. reflection, yeah. yeah. So, and all of it has to do with light. Cause if you turn the lights off of it, you don't get that, the movement and like all right. of the shine out of it. And so when you make that scratch in the surface, uh, it, it basically, once you fit them all together, well, then all of this pattern starts to come into play and they start to overlap with one another. And that's what gives it all this like shifting and moving kind of feel. It's a very yeah, it three dimensional for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're reaching out like for something to touch and yeah. it's really not there. And, and the fact that we do that, and then we have a process of varnishing where, you know, we'll add color and, and sometimes it's just raw aluminum, but some, but a lot of the times we'll, we'll add color and it goes through several different layers of that. And then finally right. gets varnished again at the very end to where it's just completely glass like and, and flat on the surface. And so, you know, all of this is happening on just a fraction of a 16th of an inch plate aluminum. Right. So everybody's like, it's so weird because it looks so deep and dimensional and yet it's so completely flat and it's just very minimally like scratched that surface yeah so um, so you walked in and saw that so i saw that like, and it was like seeing it was like seeing color for the first time you know hmm. it, it was it was really remarkable to me um you know what i was standing in front of and um and so i would go up to the gallery for like hours and i would just like stare at it and i would look at it and then i would go to his website and he had this one picture i remember of his studio and it had all these tools on the wall. Right. Yeah. And I would zoom in on those, on those tools huh. and I would go to the, like the, the home Depot or something and I would go buy tools oh, wow. and I would bring them all back and see how he was doing this. And try to right. Figure it out. And try to like, like reverse engineer it. And, um, I was mildly, mildly successful at that. And I wouldn't even say it was a, a very good attempt. Uh, so he the, was the first one to do, to do this, right. Didn't he? Like, yeah. He, came up with it yeah probably. back in the 70s he he came up with it while he was doing etching which is um print making essentially with metal plates okay and he and he was he scratched this metal plate one day and he set it on the ground in the light and he started to move with it and he was like oh wow what is that that's kind of weird so from that point on he literally developed it all the way up until 2000 w when he went straight only metal because he used to do kind of surrealist paintings and and he was a nasa artist and he would do space oh. launch photo i mean um paintings and all this stuff right yeah but in 2000 he made this change and he was highly successful and and i'm talking like he had a contract with a gallery in san francisco where he was guaranteed like 30 grand a month you know just from that gallery alone hmm. just to create these paintings that he was doing yeah. right and so then he made this decision to go into metal full-time and also kind of cut ties with all this commercial stuff that he was doing and really focus on museums and really important collections. And so it was a major change for him in his 50s and uh, in his late 50s. And that's a big oh, change. Wow, yeah. Yeah. That, like, yeah. Especially yeah, I having, was I was impressed that you made such a epiphany change or whatever at 26, 27, 28. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine being you know, in your fifties and being like, Oh, I'm super successful, but I really, I think I'm going to go do this. Yeah. He's you know? like, I'm just going to change the whole course and I'm just going to make another path. And, and he did it. I mean, like he totally awesome. did it yeah. and it was, and it really is, it really is awesome. Um, considering he came from communist Germany growing up in 1945 Wow. and he lived there all the way until the eighties, right? Like there oh. between there and Spain. And he wasn't, he was never allowed to come here and live. And he actually got a visa from NASA Hughes Aircraft Company and the Smithsonian Museum. Wow. All three of them pitched in to bring him to the States to live and work as an artist. For I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Like, it's wow. the Rolls Royce of visas. So, um, so all that happened. And, uh, he, he, you know, he came here, he made that switch, and everybody thought he was crazy. But he really... Uh, you know, he had this vision and he knew what he wanted to do and he knew how he wanted to get there. And he's so prolific. And I think he's still one of the greatest masters of our time. And it's a real, it's a real shame that he doesn't have a bigger name than he does. He's still in a lot of museums and, you know, he's known throughout the world, but you know, he's not on the l the level of like a Jeff Koons or something like that, where, you know, just millions of dollars are pouring in for these paintings. Yeah. And I think that he's really on that level. And so, um, well, I don't know anything about art. Yeah, like I, but if I had a lot of money and wanted to purchase art, some of this stuff would be what I would buy because it's and I'm not even that big of a 
abstract fan or sure. anything. But this stuff is just, I mean, people, you got to go look at it, to try to look at videos and pictures, and that'll help. But uh, if ever you get a, a chance to go to a show, go. Whether or not you can afford to buy it or yeah. not. <laughs> preferably, and, you know, preferably buy, buy yeah, some. Yeah, it's but, always, it always helps, right? It yeah. always helps us but it's know, just, do yeah, what we it's do. Just, and, and, he, and that's a whole different level. You know, when I saw him selling... Fifty to one hundred thousand dollar pieces. You, yeah, you know, you and I did some major installs at like the board of directors for McDonald's with him, like these huge sculptures that he created for him, huh. and these mega mansions and all that. Yeah. And so you see, like the and these people have like Monets hanging in their house. Right. You know, I mean, these multi million dollar paintings, and and it's like, okay, you're you're in a different league, right? And so. I was very fortunate not having an art degree. So when I first moved there, I saw that work, right? Yeah, how did you like yeah, I meet, did all get that. in touch with him or whatever? So I, I probably studied his work for about six to eight months. And then I was in the studio one night and I came out. It was about midnight. And I was just going to write him a quick email. And I wrote him like this five-page letter. <laughs> and and I ended up emailing it to him. And I thought, this guy's going to think I'm a lunatic, like just a stalker and yeah, all that. super stalker, yeah. And and plus, he was so well-known. Like, I, I never thought I would hear back from him either. Right. So um, so a month went by, and I thought, okay, that's it. Like, I'm not going to hear anything. And then I get this email from his wife, because his wife does a lot of his communications for him. And um, and she says, hey, you know, this is Tess. This is Andres' wife. And I just want to let you know how great your letter was and how much of a difference it made because he was going through this depression at the time because all of these artists were creating work that they never put their hands on, meaning they had a whole team of people, they had the idea, they let other people well, execute it, oh, and then they would go sell it for millions of dollars, right? That's kind of where the art market has gone in some instances and, huh. and had a lot of success, right? So he does everything on his own, and he just fell into this depression and didn't want to get out of bed for like three weeks. What am I doing with my life? I threw everything away. Wow. I could have been all these different things. <clears throat> and I, he receives this letter, and the letter in short basically said, hey, look, your art has changed my life. I saw this. I, this is what I want to do. It changed the path, and I may never get to meet you, but thank you. Keep doing what you're doing, essentially. Yeah, and that just means yeah. I just got goosebumps. Just think about that. What that meant to him. Yeah, he's in that like, state. yeah. He's like, I get a lot of letters like that, but he's like, this one was really personal, and I really felt like, you know, what you were feeling in that. And so she says, hey, he's coming down to Houston in like three weeks for a show. Do you want to have dinner with him? And I said, yeah, that would be awesome. You know. <laughs> So we go, we meet on the night of the show, we go there, we meet at this restaurant across the street and we had this like two and a half hour dinner and we immediately like hit it off and we had this great communication and, um, and even the gallery's calling up, he's like, you're late for the opening. Like you got to get over here right now, blah, blah. So we just lost track of time. So we went over there. He had a fantastic show, sold a lot of work and, uh, went to the after party. We hung out some more. And from that point on, we just became really great friends. And I would fly out to San Francisco where he was living at the time for a week or two and yeah. realize this guy <laughs> has never had a job outside of being an artist in his entire life. So he has wow. no idea about like a nine to five. He has no idea about a schedule. Just not even in his mind. Dude yeah. wakes up whenever he wants to, goes to bed whenever he wants to, does whatever he wants whenever he wants. And so this was a an epiphany for me. Like this yeah. was like, you know we grow up to think everybody is supposed to go to a job. You get an education, you get married, you have kids, you do this thing, right? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta get up whether you'd like it or not. You gotta get up and you gotta go to work and you do gotta it. do it. You gotta yeah. get in the system. You gotta be, you know, a contributing member of society and all right. this. And he was the first person that, that kind of allowed me to think that it was okay to be artistic and really live that kind of lifestyle. And a lot of people think it's kind of like debauchery or something where, you know, you just, you, you waste your time all day long laying around and just doing what, uh, you know, whatever it is that you do. And he, he lives a very progressive lifestyle in a lot of different ways. And, uh, and it just really opened my eyes and he had this fabulous place out in San Francisco, like 15 minutes North of the golden gate on this mountaintop wow. in this <laughs> yeah. gigantic house that had a huge veranda that looked at, it was all like Balinese, like going to Bali or something, so right? Great. With a huge pool overlooking a mountain. It was like spectacular. Because you went to a show in Houston and saw his work and sent him a five and sent him a letter, email. man. Yeah. Like sent him a letter. letter yeah. Like, I mean, and from that and, and from that point on, we would go back and forth from Houston to San Francisco and we would see one another. And then I would start going on trips with him to like Peru 
And was he know, starting to show you like how to do? So I was stuff? starting to kind of like what you know, and he would never let anybody in the studio, and he would never let anybody like know the secrets and the and the tricks to all this stuff because there's wow. a lot. There's a really yeah, a lot that goes imagine, into yeah. it. And so I would sit there very quietly in the back of the studio for hours with my headphones on and watch him grind and like watch him do this metal and spray and do all this stuff, right? And little by little, he would kind of like pull me over and like show me a little like like a little secret about something. This little trick here. This little trick here. This little trick there. And he's and I would show him like something that I was doing and he was like, Well, you know, you're doing this wrong, so do this. And um so that went on for a couple of years. That went on for two, maybe three years. And so this whole time you're you're working like a day job. Still? I'm doing my I'm yeah. doing my day job from 2000 and, and essentially six, and here it is probably 2009 or 10. Yeah. And I've already been working with him and like seeing little secrets and all that. And I'm still like hustling. I'm still doing it. And in two in uh, 2010, I moved back to San Antonio because I got transferred again from Houston back to San Antonio. Doing the oil, doing the oil, oil and gas stuff. thing. Yeah, yep. okay. doing that. And I had progressed up through the company. and was managing a, a group of people then, and and so I was making a really good living. I mean, yeah. you know, very comfortable six figure income, and uh, and it was allowing me to do things like buy a big home and then build a studio on it, and like yeah. all these things That's that awesome. yeah. I was prepping in my mind. I was thinking like, okay. I want to do all these things, but I know that I have to not only raise my education and my skill level, but I also have to have a place to work and I have to have a a special, um, you know, rooms and all of this because this type of work requires that you have to do it. Yeah. And so, um, over the time since 2010, I started building these studios like onto my house, one room and then another room. And then I just built an industrial spray booth at the beginning of this year uh, to, to do a lot of the work. And so, you know, my studio has grown to about 2,000 square feet now wow. attached to my Is main here, house. Here, here in San Antonio? Yeah, here in San Antonio. And, um, and so th- during that whole time, you know, again, Andres and I have been talking, and he sees the, the progression that I'm doing on my own. Yeah, he's showing me a lot, but he sees how involved I am and how, you know, regi- regimented I was about, you know, I'd get off work at 5 o'clock, I'd go home and get into the studio at nighttime, and, just and work, on, and, just work. and I would work until in, into the night. And then on the weekends, I was in there Saturday and Sunday all day long. So I was sacrificing a lot. I, I was actually married at the time. And, uh, and it took a huge toll on, on my marriage, which is huh. obviously why I'm not, not married now. Um, but it took a huge toll on that. And then I lost friends and all that because, you know, I was just not investing the time in those areas. Right. And they were all just going, I mean, I still, you know, partied and did fun stuff, but I wasn't doing that on a regular basis as much as I was really spending a lot of time in the studio. Cause I knew that one day I wanted to leave the job and I wanted to do art full time. And so, um, I guess 2013 came, that's when I, I went through this divorce and, and I was involved in the arts. I was making progress. And then, uh, 2013 hit that happened. And then I just kind of like took a hiatus for about six months. I just like chilled out from art, from art. Yeah. yeah, From art. And, and I just like rethought about everything. Like, what am I doing? What's important? And, uh, and I, I went on this trip to Peru with Andreas and, uh, we had this long talk over several weeks and, uh, and he kind of like reignited that fire for me. And at the same time I met my fiance now, uh, back in 2013. So we've been together for about four years and she's an artist. She's a, a hair artist, like a hair, she owns a salon, but she does like New York fashion week and all that. So, oh, nice. so I met her and she was very, very supportive in, in, in what it means to be an artist. And it she takes, understood. It takes it. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, look, I'm in the studio all the time too, doing things. And like, I'm creative and I know like you got to have your, your times. And so if you're not with somebody who understands that as an mm. artist, whether it's a musician, whether it's a painter, whatever, like that, you're going to, it's going to be a bumpy road, man. You yeah. Know? I had a, my last, I guess my last serious girlfriend that ended when, uh, some point we were talking and she said, I just feel like you love your music more than you love me. And I had no response for that whatsoever. And so in my head I thought, well, this is, uh, I guess this is over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you see the signs, you like, yeah. you, you know, sometimes you push them aside, but you know, deep down, you know, if it's taking a toll or not. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you just know it. And, and there is no way if you're truly meant to do it, there is no way that you're dropping music or you're dropping yeah, art or whatever, I mean, like the loves are going to come and go, um, until you find the person that really is, is, is 
ready to invest in you in that vision, right? It's got to be a team. It's got to be a team. And so everything, when that happened, everything broke wide open for me, Uh, meaning I got picked up by another gallery. Things were starting to get bigger. Uh, The work was starting to get better. And so this uh, whole time, were you doing shows? Or yeah, yeah, I was. I was doing shows here and there. I was selling paintings at that time. I didn't really care though because I had this great income and yeah, you know, it's like if you sell. Were you doing shows of like paintings or like the? Yeah, I was doing both. Thing. I was okay. doing both. Yeah, I had a couple different styles that I that I was working in. I still work in in a couple different mediums. Uh, metal being my main one, but but I was doing different types of shows and, and still doing the networking and still, you know, making my name and, and, and getting that kind of like recognition. And I was starting to get shows at like the university of Texas here, uh, in yeah. San Antonio. And like, I was making more, more friends and, in, in, in a, in a bigger circle and more stuff started happening in San Antonio, which was good. But, um, so in 2013, when we started getting together and talking about all this stuff. And she asked me, okay, what's your, what's your dream? What do you want to be doing? I said, well, I want to be doing art full time. And I never thought that I was going to be able to do it because once you get to a certain level of like income, right, you start to think that I have to do this all the time. Like I have to maintain this level. I can't go. Yeah. yeah, Like I can't go backwards Mm -hmm. or I have to maintain this like high income to be able to live the lifestyle that I want. (laughs) And slowly she started kind of like chipping away at that that idea in, in, you know, showing me how we could do this thing like together. So, uh, during a trip out to San Francisco with Andreas, you know, we were out there together and she said, okay, it's 2014. It was August of 2014. She said in the next two years, you're going to go full time. And I thought, wow, okay. You know, seemed like a long shot, but I, I started really like thinking about it and what that meant and how I was going to change my life and how I was going to kind of make ends meet if I let go of this thing over here. And my identity was rolled up into that too. Right. Right. So like all your whole life is kind of built around this thing. And, and, uh, you know, your parents are proud and your friends are, think it's really cool and all this kind of stuff. And then, but you're realizing that you're doing it for everybody else and not necessarily just for you. And, um, and so, you know, those two, it was a rough two years because then now my mind is like focused on trying to get out of there and, here I am still like working through all of this, this corporate stuff. And, and so it was really like, um, it was heavy on my mind having to do the job while you're thinking about, why I think about breaking away of the job, you know? So then you're, you start to suffer a little bit on the, on the work side. Right. Mm So anyways, um, so those two years happened and sure enough, I set the date of January of 2016 that I was going to, that I was going to quit. And I remember, uh, like leading up to it, it was like November of, of 2015. And I was yeah. like, woof, like here it is two months away. Like I, you know, I don't know if I have, you know, the guts to, to pull the trigger on this thing. And she just kept saying, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And, uh, and the day came and I didn't get any sleep that night. I remember that. And, and I, and I went into an early morning meeting, like at 9am and I, it was in there with my boss and I had a couple of clients that we were in there with and I was yawning like through the whole meeting. And he was like, and he actually, you know, looked over at me, he goes, Hey, are we, uh, we keeping you up or, or what? And I said, <laughs> no, I'm, you over here? yeah, I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, I just, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I knew right then. Cause it was always on my mind, like going into it that morning, like I'm going to go in there and I'm going to give him this whole, you know, resignation speech and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And, uh, and I knew that I had to do it. And, and so I walked out of that meeting and said, okay, like I need to see you for about five minutes. Okay. You know, walked in there and I said, look, there's no easy way to say it, but, uh, you know, you know, I'm an artist and and the company was very supportive of me. They, they own like 12 pieces in the building that I worked in. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he was. Also, I would think with you taking trips and going to California and stuff, they had to have known. He know, and he knew, and he had been in my gallery. He had bought paintings from me, my boss. Right. So like they were all very supportive and they knew like what was in my heart. Right. And, but I don't think that he ever thought that I was going to walk away from a lucrative job, you know? And, uh, and so I did. And I, I let, I, I said it that day and I just, I never do like a, two week notice or something. I said, yeah. I said, Hey, I'll give you two weeks. Like, you know, and then I've got to go to California. Uh, so 
I gave him two weeks right when I quit. I jumped in my van, drove to California, uh, up to San Francisco from San San Antonio. Wow. And, uh, and did this real kind of like self discovery thing by myself, you know, all the way up there thinking about it. And I went to go visit Andreas again Wow. and I spent about two or three weeks with him. And, uh, and I, what did he have to say when you told him? He said, good for you. Yeah. He said, now get ready. Yeah, right. <laughs> he said this. Now the work starts. He goes, nobody ever, just remember one thing. Nobody ever told you to be an artist, right? Mm. He said, you're the one that either makes or breaks it. Oh, that's good. And, it, and he said, it's tough. And he goes, I've lived it for 50 years. He goes, there's ups and downs and some of it's really good and some of it's really bad. But realize that 99% of the artists that are out there never make a living at, at doing what they love. Yeah. So that was really heavy, you know, and we, and we had had those talks before, so I knew that, but you know, I didn't realize until I started depending on art for living that, you know, how difficult it really was and, and how much of a hustle you really have to keep and what you really have to do to make it and get that name out there. And, you know, there's a lot of people that have shows. There's a lot of people that don't sell work at their shows though. How does it work with, um, with you were talking earlier about the galleries, some guy getting like a thirty thousand dollar guarantee or whatever. Yeah. How does how does that work? Like the gallery says, if you don't sell that much, we'll make well, we'll well that gallery already knew that they were selling that much and more. Oh, like they already every knew. single month. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they already you. knew that and they were like, Look, we'll just do put they, you on retainer essentially. Do the galleries do they get like a percentage of what was sold at the thing. How do they make money? So like all, so most commercial galleries get 50%. Okay? 50? 50? Five, five zero? Five zero. Jeez. So you think about like selling for having, houses for having, or cars. opening the doors and turning the lights on. So this is where, and everybody has that same reaction, and this is where you really got to understand is, is you know, it, it used to mean a lot because the galleries would have to like put you in, in magazines and they would have to do all this publications for you and they would build your name and they would build your reputation. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of that 50% came in. But now the galleries just open their doors and, and hang you your work. The, and you do all the social media and advertising. You, you do a lot of that. that. I mean, they yeah. do some well, of that yeah. stuff and they, and they do open some doors and obviously they have a list of clientele that's, that can afford that work. And they know to come like people know to go to the gallery to go there. Yeah, right. right. So they, they, so they built all that in there. Right. And, and do I still think 50% is fair? You know, I don't know, maybe not. However, they do set your price point and they okay. do a lot to, to build your reputation. Hopefully if they're, if they're a good gallery. Right. Um, and if you really want to sell work, then you've got to get with galleries that move a lot of artwork and they do what they need to do. And, yeah. and, um, and if you're lucky enough to get into one of those and you're lucky enough to have shows and then you're even luckier to sell the work, then you know that you've gotten on to something that, that actually works and you can make potentially a living at it. So here it is, what, June of or July of 2017. So I've been at it for a year and a half year and now a half. full time. And, and um, you're still alive. You're still and breathing. I'm still breathing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I still wake up and it's, you know, it feels like a dream sometimes. And, and you, you never know where the money's going to come from necessarily, but it always just somehow happens. Yeah. And you got to learn to like manage cash flow too, right? Cause you could have a month or two where it's dry as a bone. Right. And then that third month, like you have a surplus and then you kind of like replenish yourself for the months that you miss. So you've right. got to learn, like if you're used to two weeks, every, every two weeks that, that paycheck being in the bank and you know what that's going to be, things up you got to change so, yeah. things up. And, and my sister, uh, my sister tells me about that cause she's a teacher. Mm-hmm. So she knows every two or every month or every two weeks or whatever, you know, like you were talking about, she's going to get X amount every month. It's going to be this much every month. Her payments are this much. She knows exactly whatever. And, and I'm the same way as like the art thing. Like, some months are terrible. Yep. And then some months are great. Yep. You know, and, and that's it. Yeah. And that's, and you just got to learn then to manage your lifestyle. I think the hard part for me was that I had this, I came with this huge overhead, right? Like a, a big house and, you know, cars. An established and way of Like life. an established yeah, yeah. way of living. And like a, and so I didn't necessarily reduce that whenever I left. I just kept, I just knew that I had to meet a certain level in order to maintain that. Did because, you ever have to pull that? Well, I mean, like we're not, down? we don't, we, we still travel a lot. Uh, we don't quite do all the things that we do that we did before, but the amount of time that you regain by being your own boss and living your own lifestyle and calling your own shots. I mean, it's unreal. It's unreal. Like people. And and I really started to think about that. Like, you know, if, if everybody knew how good that felt to do it, I don't think there would be nearly as many people going into the workplace like they do. If they, everybody just figured out what their hustle was and like what they really loved and figured out how to do it. But 
it's scary and it's and it's it saddens me so much to see like people I care about and people I know and my friends and family when they and I hear people talk about it. it's just a common thing you go into the bank you hear it people talking about oh I'm so happy it's Friday or oh Monday you know people wish away five of the seven days of the absolutely. week absolutely that's five sevenths of your life. Yeah. I mean, and you're sleeping the majority that like your one third of your life is sleeping and the right. other one third is like working. Right. Yeah. So like you barely get any time for yourself. And then yeah. if you throw a family on top of that or whatever, then all of a sudden you're all of your time is devoted somewhere. Yeah. There's, and, a, there's a you under there somewhere. Yeah. And there has to be. Yeah. And, and I think if you, I think some people are fine with that. Like some right. people just go to work, they do what they do. They come home to their kids and they have a great time. Totally. Yeah. There's, but for some people like you and I probably, there's all, always something like scratching at us you know there's mm-hmm. always something like y- y- you want to you want to get something out of you because i think whether it's music or art like there's something that's in you that's living there that needs to be expressed and if you don't do that it's going to make you a very unhappy person and when i took that little 6 month hiatus uh, i was an unhappy person I-, I was figuring out who i was again and like yeah. where my life was going to go <laughs> and so um, i was thinking a lot about that but i certainly missed the you know, the constructive part of, of being an artist and going in my studio, which is really, I think to me, still one of the most sacred places of going in there and having that energy of, you know, turning the music on and getting the lights just right and putting the incense on and, you know, having a drink in there and, you know, just creating, creating, like really creating that space, like walking into the studio when you're about to do tracks or something, right? Like you just have that buzz and I'm lucky enough to roll out of bed and like be able to go into the next room and like have that. Right. And, and that's what I always wanted. And it still to this day uh, is very important to me and something that I I am very conscious about going into the studio and working every single day and at least just sitting in there and looking and feeling. And and if I didn't have that, it would be a much different life for me. And um, And I think I always knew that to some degree. And I knew that I couldn't, I could hack the nine to five but it just wasn't fulfilling and it wasn't something that I could see myself right. doing all the way to the end. And then I started seeing like all these, my dad was in the same business and uh, actually worked for the same company. And I saw a lot of those guys get pushed out at like an, at a later age and they contributed their whole life to this company. Hmm. And, you know, getting asked to retire. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. Kind yeah, of like, so like can, nudged yeah. out for all the new people like coming in and, and, and that's the things that you get for you know, two guys half as much. And get, exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And new blood and, and, I've seen it. Yeah. And, and you do, and that happens a lot and there's no security on that side of it. Just because you think you have that paycheck every two weeks, you get this false sense of security right? when there's not, you know, like it could, it could be done in a second. Then you're out there like looking for another job or looking for something else to do. And, um, and I didn't want to be at that point. And I certainly didn't want to be at the point of being older and looking back and saying to myself, like, I wonder what would have happened if I just would have taken that plunge and just tried it. Because ding, was, ding, ding. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, that's absolutely. It. You have to. Yeah. Like, I, I think, you know, if anybody's listening out there, you absolutely have to go for it at some point in your life, whether it's scary, you may have to start over. You may have to, whatever it is, whatever it is, yeah. man. Like, you, you know, you may just fall flat on your face. You don't know. And and a lot of people have, and a lot of people just get back up and try something new or, or just keep trying at what they're doing. Um, and maybe it leads to somewhere and maybe it doesn't, but at least you get that satisfaction of really digging into yourself and knowing what you're made of and know that you that you did all that you could to try to accomplish that. And I guarantee you at the end of your life, looking back at that, you're going to be a much happier person. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Amen. And the choir starts singing. That's in the background. it. <laughs> mm. Get me. I feel like a, like a preacher on Sunday over here. Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, yeah. I wonder like with me, music, like you're talking about something inside of you scratching to get out. Uh, also, in addition to that, like to me, a huge reason of why I choose to do what I do is of what it meant to me being on the other side. Does that make sense? Like yes. being a consumer, like what music has done for me since oh, yeah. as long as I can remember and what even podcasting right now, like what, what podcasts have done for me in the last three or four years that I've been listening to them, just kind of like being able to generate that and give it back out there to more people. Absolutely. Is kind of, 
what does that is does that apply like to it it does our thing you know because be, like what you felt when you walked in and saw his work you know, yeah that you maybe somebody somebody will walk in and see yours and think that you know. and, and that's and I you know I and I have gotten a lot of that and that's so cool and it's still very alien to me because I know how that feels like looking at other people's art and admiring it so much that it feels weird when somebody does that to me you know like yeah. you're almost like well I'm not there yet like I don't feel I don't know if you ever feel like you're quite there as an artist or as, or as a musician like that you're doing the best that you can do like you always have some always something place to go to yeah, yeah. and so when people like say those things you you kind of have to take a step back and look at all the things that you have accomplished and even my mentor says he goes I cannot believe that where you started at in 2006 or 7 and now you're doing what you're doing here because we work very very closely now like on collaborative pieces oh, and yeah. and cool. you know I, I help him with a lot of things now he I'm at a level technically now to where I'm I can actually work with him and that feels really, really cool. Yeah. You know, like really accomplished. And I, I've always like how chased old, how old after he? that. He's 72. Okay. So, and he's, you know, he's got all this life and, you know, he's got all this energy and he still has a great presence and he's still very, very active. And, and this medium is, is extremely, uh, dangerous number one, but it's also, yeah, you work with like metal grinders, oh, right? I yeah. mean like high speed tools and, you know, very toxic paints and, you know, things that we have to have regulators for and, and spray booths and exhausts and all this different kind of stuff. But, you know, it's a very physically demanding type of work also. And he's still like going at it strong. So, um, I think I bring a lot of that to him also because I have, he has like this young energy that's always around him and always pushing him and always like you know, interest in what he's doing. So yeah. that, that I think over the past 10 years, him and I, our relationship has done wonders from one another. And I've turned him on to different mediums that have changed his complete style, you know, like huh. different paints that he never knew it existed or whatever that he just like his work exploded with. And so, um, you know, we've done a lot of that for one another and, you know, he'll say that he's learned a lot from me too in a lot of different ways, but you know, it wasn't just about art for me. It, you, being a musician or as an art or an artist, you have to learn to kind of like live a certain lifestyle too. And if you don't have anybody that's that's that example or like showing that to you, yeah, that that's a hard thing to like. You know, how do I how do Figure I do this? How, yeah. how do I live? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? And you would think that it would be kind of Especially like natural. Especially for you, converting. I mean, that's converting right. Converting from someone who is in the corporate world, yeah, to military, that. you right. know, I mean, yeah, conservative sure. upbringing, like all these different things, like to be a bohemian and to be kind of artistic and without rules and without anything that, that took me a long time to wear that away and like chip that away. And, um, it was always lying in there like underneath, but I never had that like kind of permission with myself or anybody else to say, look, you can go and be however you want to be. Hmm. And, uh, and he did that a lot for me. So on, on, on the outside, just in life in general, from a philosophical standpoint, you know, he really progressed my life in art, but in also in daily life. So, you know, you're talking just a major contributor to, to, to who I am today. Yeah. And sure. there's no place in the world that I've ever could have gone, you know, and learned any of those things art wise, or just, you know, just the, the it lifestyle taken wise. You probably 50 years to maybe so, yeah. or maybe never, or you yeah, know, maybe never. Maybe never yeah. Cause I maybe, I, I certainly don't think that I would have been as accepted if I didn't have that kind of like pedigree behind me, because I can say like, he's the one that taught me because a lot of people know him and yeah. they give me opportunities because of his name too. So, yeah. um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that opens a lot of doors and, and just like, you know, I think we have a friend, I don't know if you, if you know him all that well, but, uh, BJ golden, um, uh, no, I think Mark, this Mark and those guys, that Mark is friends with. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But he's out of Nashville too. Okay. And you know, he plays with Brantley Gilbert and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, those guys. Totally, yeah. Um, but that was kind of the same thing, you know, with him about opportunities that he got as like a, a you know, I remember him, him coming through San Antonio. Uh, this was a couple of years before he went to Brantley's band and got that opportunity. But, you know, he got an, a master's degree in guitar and then, you know, he was doing uh, live shows, like all the sound for live shows and doing all the guitar yeah. tech and everything okay. else. So he was he came through town with Lyle Lovett. Um, you know, I think that was I don't know what year that was, maybe. 2014 or something. Um, and you know, he came through and, and he was playing in the green room one day. He, he was trained like in flamenco and, uh, he was playing in the green room, just 
messing around and, and, uh, Lyle walked by and heard it and said, Hey man, you know, I really like that huh. guitar plan. Why don't you do the, why don't you open for the band? Uh, and I'll let you do like a 20 minute, like classical guitar thing. And huh. that's cool. I mean, next thing you know, he's, he's opening up for Lyle Lovett and like doing this thing every show, you because know, because he just heard him because he just heard him like yeah. playing in there. And then that gave him confidence and it gave him kind of like a little bit of a name, like, Hey, I opened for Lyle Lovett and all right. these different yeah. shows. Yeah, for sure. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's back in Colorado wondering what he's going to do. He gets his call from Nashville. He flies out there. They see his resume, all these things that he's done. And, yeah. and, uh, and you know, next thing you know, he's the utility player for Brantley Gilbert. Now he's traveled all over the world with them for the past Is he still with him? three or four years. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, um, you never know where that opportunity comes from or when you're, you know, you have to be ready and you have yeah. to, you know, put yourself out there, whether it's writing a letter or it's, you know, playing in a green room or just always looking for those opportunities. And you never know when they're going to uh, turn up or, or where it's going to lead to, but you have to get out there. And I think just do it like you're doing, you know, you yeah. hit the road and you play the cities and you Figure bust your out. ass, man, yeah. you know, and you hope that you have a good time doing it, right? Like you hope that, yeah. That, that, because people think, oh, well, you know, you might, you have all the time in the world and you're doing this and that, and it must be great. Well, let me tell you, there's some times, and BJ and, a, BJ and I talk about it, like he's on the tour bus going from city to city with, with 10 other dudes in the bus, and he's like, yeah. this isn't all that fun all the right, time, yeah. you know? And yeah, people uh, think you're traveling the yeah. world and seeing all these yeah. things when you see the inside of a tour bus or a van yeah. and the venue and the hotel, mm -hmm. you know, if you get a hotel. Yeah, you're not Led Zeppelin, man. <laughs> right, you know, yeah. you're not, you know, the groupies aren't like waiting Oh, backstage yeah. and yeah. you're not hitting the hotel and like trash in the room and like having a great time. No, it's uh, a different, uh, it's a different age. It's a different age. And, and, but you know, I, I think that you just have to keep everything in perspective and realize how lucky we are to do the things that we do. You know, I, to I love, yeah. To do is to wake up yeah, and do the, the media, the mediocre shit during the day, knowing yeah. that that stuff is for the general purpose of something that you love doing. Exactly. You know? And when you have a shitty day, like you gotta, you gotta kind of wrap your head around that and be yeah. like, okay, maybe I've had a rough week or two weeks or a month or whatever, but you know, you would have, you would have done anything to have this bad month when you were working, doing that job that you hated doing, yeah. you know, Seven you would have like, ago, yes, whatever, yeah. yeah, you would have died to do that. So like, keep that perspective and don't get lazy and don't rest on all the things that you've accomplished because you've got to be. I think even more active as you get older and, and the more that you accomplish, the more you just got to like try that much harder to stay relevant and do all these, like, it's like music, yeah. right? You see how fast that landscape changes and you know, what becomes popular from one year to the next. And yeah. you know, you're not doing EDM. Be happy, with, be happy with what you've done and where you are, but constantly be looking ahead and, and, and keep yeah. being aware of the changes and what's going on. Absolutely, yeah. man. Like you, you've got to just, you've got to be hungry for it and you've got to be thankful for it at the same time. So, so what, uh, um, what do you have shows going on currently right now? Exhibits? Or I, shows? Um, shows is that what the, the, the yeah, lingo is? Shows, shows? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Usually. Um, I, I had that, I had a show in San Antonio here for contemporary art month in March, which is the one that you that went one, to. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so that was a, that's a big month for San Antonio. All the contemporary art happens in the city during that month. And so that was a big solo show for me here. I usually get one of those a year with my gallery and then I'll do some group shows with them. Um, but you know, since I've been focusing on getting outside of San Antonio, like Santa Fe, like Houston, like, uh, you know, Hawaii, I do spend a great deal of time making sure that they're like s stocked with paintings Yeah. and then, you know, maybe I'll do a show with them and I'll kind of like get all that stuff ready too. Uh, so I don't have any shows happening right now, although I am creating work for both Hawaii and Santa Fe and like those paintings are getting shipped out and like sent to so those you have places. The, the show's scheduled and now you're like prepping the work and yes. doing the work that's going to be in the shows. Yeah. And sometimes they don't even like, sometimes they don't even have the, a show like for you. Um, they'll just take that into inventory and they'll put that on the walls because in commercial galleries, okay. um, they're not always just showing like one exhibit by one artist. Sometimes they'll just have just a have bunch a of couple, paintings like yeah. hung. Okay. And that's where people come in off the street and they like buy, you know, buy artwork. Do you get more, do you do no more business by just you create something and then sell and then that one sells or by like commission do you ever have people like i do a lot of commission work yeah because yeah, they'll see this one and you know they'll be like oh i love that piece but i need it to be more 
you know, we always hate this, but like more blue or more red or, yeah. you know, like something that's in their, something in their matches decor, you know what I mean? Room, yeah. And you, and as an artist, like you, you have to be cognizant about that, right? Like you yeah. have to realize that there's some shit you're going to do that you don't necessarily want to do, but you've got to pay the bills, man. So right. like, you know, that's an interesting thing that, that musicians don't really necessarily do agree is that like, I mean, some people do, but not, not very regularly to somebody you know, say, all right, you just let me know what you saw, what song you'd like and yeah, we'll yeah. write it for you. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. Or, you know, maybe you'll get a gig and they'll ask you to do like, oh man, do some Skinner or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's not what you do. And, and that's not something you want to resort to, but maybe if you get a gig and they ask you to throw that's a in good some, point. It is some playlists, like, okay. Yeah. It's like covers, yeah. you know, yeah. sometimes you do those types of things, but you know, there's two different worlds and I should preface this because a lot of people don't know it. But there's there's two different worlds in the art world. There's the commercial art world where, you know, they're in business to sell paintings. OK. Mm -hmm. And then there's the art world that's a little bit more um, academic, if you will, meaning it, it's more on the museum side and these like uh, foundations that that have residencies for artists and all this. And they're, they're doing this on a level of of importance in the whole timeline of art, if you will, okay. you know, they're considered very important artists and they'll go in the history books and, yeah, you know, okay. Relative to his history and yeah. Like what's going on right okay, now. Society. And, okay, gotcha. Yeah. And yeah, there's yeah. a lot of curators that are really important or a lot of big collectors that are like, you know, focused on those people. And, and so a lot of us try to ride that line between the two because a lot of museum artists that aren't really high up or really big don't make a lot of money. And, yeah. and they just are imp in, in important in collections and have and have really cool shows and but they don't have like but they don't have like a big maybe. lifestyle yeah. you know maybe it's because their work is not that saleable or maybe it's because um, they're only focused on those types of shows and not don't care about making any money right. which some I know a lot of people that are like that um, but for those of us that have to worry about both sides of it then you have to ride this line of selling paintings to whoever, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully you get into really big collections, both private and public and corporate and all that stuff. Um, but you're also selling to normal Joe over there. That's just looking for a painting over his couch, you know? Yeah. And so the museums though, kind of like frown upon that, you know, they don't want you to be in these like schlocky little galleries selling paintings to put over the couch because then you don't really have the significance of <sighs> what it takes to be in a museum. So there's this catch 22 of, you know, you got to be really careful about where you're showing and what you're doing, even if you are selling work, if you ever want to get over to this museum side and be in the history books and be important gotcha. and considered in that. So I've, I've read, I've ridden that line for, uh, you know, my whole entire art career because I, I, I do find a lot of value in, in being in important collections and being in museums and trying to do that side of it as well. Yeah. But then trying to still, you know, live as an artist yeah. and, and maintain a, a lifestyle. So, uh, a lot of people just don't have any kind of understanding about that, or they think it's all the same thing when it's really quite. Yeah, I wouldn't different. have ever none. I yeah, you never, you never would have. You would never would have. People, you know, you sell paintings, and if they're really popular, then you become a historical artist. Yeah, but it's not. No, huh. not at all. I mean, because you could sell. I mean, I know artists that are selling hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of paintings, and there's not a museum that's even aware of them. You know, like huh. would never even know their name. Really. And so, and that's just because they focused on making that kind of money and not on the the academic side. So, you have to decide in your career where you want to be at. And hopefully it's not too late. You're on one side or the other, you know, because if you do all these like installation art in there that nobody can ever put into their home because it, it's some crazy thing that you constructed in this room, right? Yeah, that you okay. can't can, that you can't install in somebody's home. Right. But if that's what you do, then maybe you're going to get into all these different museums and shows if you're that good. And but nobody's ever going to be able to buy your work besides like the museums, museums that put that on yeah. full time. Do they do the museums pay? For, um, for the work, usually they have they have funds that get put together by by wealthy donors, yeah. and uh, and these funds that 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 the museum throws benefits for and all of that, uh, the endowments basically, and and that's what allows them to go out there and buy these important works of art. Well, where can they go to see your stuff? Uh, what like website yeah? So or um, um, you know, I do the social media thing. Uh, it's Eric Breish. It's E R I C. Last name is Breish. B R E I S H. And the Instagram is Eric underscore Breish 
underscore art. So that's my handle on Instagram. Uh, and then you can also go to my website, which is just www.ericbreisch.com. Oh, so okay. yeah, check both of those out. I do have to update the, uh, the website for some new, some of the new paintings that are, that are out there from the last show. But you know, that's, that's the other thing is there's a lot of, uh, you know, you got to handle all the social media, like, you know, yeah. and, oh, and yeah. it's a lot to keep up with, you know, when, when you're just a, an individual musician for or an sure. artist, it's a lot, there's a lot of um, different dynamics. What? So you said the, the New Mexico and the Hawaii thing are coming up. Is that what you said? Yeah. So if you're ever in Santa Fe, um, there is a street on Canyon road and that's called gallery Corazon and it's, her name is Heidi over there. It, the address is 520 Canyon road. And uh, I have some work up there. And then if you're ever over in Maui, um, I have a couple different galleries over there. One that's in Makawao. It's Wertheim, W-E-R-T-H-I-M, Contemporary. And then uh, there's a place over in Paia as well. So I'll know. put all that in the yeah, show I'll, notes. I'll, I'll give you an email with all that information. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes page at dontstifleme.com slash 019. This will be 19. 19, nice. Um, well, cool, man. This has been awesome because I've learned. I just got to sit back and listen to all this uh, stuff that I had no idea about. Right. So. I pre- well, I appreciate the uh, you know the time, and I, I love listening to the podcasts and just all what you're doing here. So it's just a it, it's an honor to be here as not a musician and do something a little bit different. So that's really cool. At all, man. Well, yeah. thanks for talking. Thank you very much. some piano action for you today on the outro that is my grandma's piano in the background in all of its out of tune glory (laughs) thanks to eric for coming in and talking about the visual art world something about which i knew very little before this conversation i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did Uh, for more info on eric bryce some examples of his work links to where you can go see his work in person which i very highly recommend you can find all that over at don'tstifleme.com slash 019. Thank you so much for listening, my friends, my friends, my family, people I love. Uh, if you have any questions or any feedback or just want to say hey, you can send that over to jacob at don'tstifleme.com or on any of the social medias at DSM Podcast for the podcast, at Jacob Stiefel for mine. You can go to jacobstiefel.com for merchandise, music, tour dates, all of that. And there it was, episode 19. Eric Breisch is the man, one of my favorite humans, and one of my, one of my best good friends. Now, everybody out there, go find something you love that makes you happy and do that. And I'll talk to you again soon. See ya. Mm-hmm.